Check, check. Good morning, Water's Edge Church. Welcome, welcome. All right, I'm Josh, pastor here at the Water's Edge, along with Eric Reinerson here. And um, I'm going to start us off just, just giving you a little testimony of what happened um, last night in our family. So here's, here's what happened, and I, I just pray that this would really encourage you to ask God your requests. So last morning, yesterday morning, I was reading my daily Bible reading, and I came across the text where one of the disciples' mothers was sick with a fever. And I said, this is really interesting. Why is this jumping out the page at me? And Jesus lays his hands on this dear woman, rebukes the fever, and what does the fever do? It leaves. And I said, this is really standing out to me. I don't know why. Well... Unknown to me, my daughter, who has chicken pox all over her body, Faith, became extremely delirious last night at about 11. She comes into the room, she's shaking, she's incoherent, and I touch her head and she's got this burning fever. 
and all of a sudden the verse comes right back to me that I read in the morning. And I said, I'm supposed to pray in faith over my daughter. I'm going to rebuke this fever. And Lord, I trust you in faith that you're going to remove this fever. And I mean, she, we called the ambulance. It was so bad. I mean, she was burning up. I've never seen her like this. She was, her eyes are open, and yet she wasn't there. She was saying things like from conversations in movies, things like that. And so I just started praying over her. I said, fever be gone in the name of Jesus, just like Jesus rebuked the fever. She, the ambulance showed up, and within like 30 seconds, she was back to normal. She was, and, and the ambulance, I told everyone uh, that came in from um, the, the hospital there, I said, listen, this is, this is the way that she just was. And I said, maybe you should just start talking to her. And they started asking her questions. They said, okay, who's the president? She said, it's Donald Trump. Um, where do you live? I'm in Duluth. You know, where do you go to school? She's answering him. She was not coherent 30 seconds before that. And I just said, thank you, Jesus. And, and before these nine guys that were in our living room, I said, guys, I, I believe in God. And I, I pray. I prayed over her, and she's better. So praise God. That's what he does. Let's give this time to God, shall we? Father God, we thank you for this morning where we can come before you, and your word makes it so clear. Ask, Jesus said, and you shall receive. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Thank you for being such a good and glorious and great God that when we ask according to your will, you hear us and you answer. And my wife and I were just marveling last night at your great goodness. And thank you that I can share this story about your power with your people today. And that there's nothing we have to fear, no virus or anything. We can trust in you, that you're in control. In Jesus' name, we worship you today. Amen.
When I stand accused by my regrets And the devil roars his empty threats I will preach the gospel to myself That I am not a man condemned For Jesus Christ is my defense My sin is nailed to the cross My soul is healed by the scars The weight of the guilt I bear no Shaming over me like the arrows of the enemy. I will run again to Calvary, that rugged hill of hell's defeat, my fortress and my victory. My sin is nailed to the cross. morning. This chapter has been one that I've recited to, to myself many times this week. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. We are his. Purchased. We are his people. 
the sheep of his pasture. We have a shepherd, a good shepherd. And he will hold us fast. When I feel my fear boil, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path. For hear your voice. I know my master's call. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Turn your eyes 
strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We just, we turn to you, Jesus. We get our answers from you. You fill us with your love and things just aren't so scary anymore. You will hold us fast. And we thank you and we praise you this morning be with your saints here at home around this city around this country around the world God we just pray for encouragement and in your name we ask these things Jesus amen so go ahead and just wave to one another this morning or <laughs> Give the corona shake, I guess. And then I'll let Eric. Normally there is child care at this time, but we do not have child care this morning, so. All right.
mic. No. <coughs> We're set. Good. Okay. Hey, Finley, what you doing, dude? <laughs> okay, check, check. Can you hear me? I don't know if this is Viz on or not. Hello, hello. Oh, yeah, now you got it. Now you got it. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Water's Edge Community Church. I'm Eric Reinertsen, uh, one of the pastors here. And it's great to see a, a few folks here with us this morning. I really had no idea who would be here and who wouldn't be here today. So I, I'm glad to have somebody to, to preach to. Praise the Lord. And I uh, just want to uh, welcome in uh, those that are watching from home. We know that a lot of people are planning to tune in from home today. So a special welcome to you guys, too. I don't really know where to look. I suppose it's up here to the camera is where I look for that. Yeah. So, yeah. Good to, good to have you here today worshiping the Lord. Okay. So at the water's edge, if you look on the front uh, of the bulletin there, our vision is to raise up churches full of good ambassadors for Christ who are learning to love, live, and lead like Jesus in Lincoln Park, their neighborhoods, and beyond. And uh, we see this, this morning service, this morning worship gathering uh, as a, a big piece of that puzzle. And the, and the cool thing about it in the modern age is that, uh, you know, you could tune in from home even and, and still be a part of this worship service. So hoping that you're blessed and, and equipped to, uh, to be uh, a good ambassador for Christ in this upcoming week through this time together today. In front of you are uh, some blue communication cards there. And... Uh, those are particularly important at this point in time in the life of our church in that if you're not on our email list, um, it would be really great if, if you want to know what's going on at the church, that would be the way that you could find that out. Okay, because we send out a lot of email communications this week. Things were changing throughout the week. Uh, you know, we were talking about things that were canceled or not canceled and what's happening and, and different things like that. So um, if you want to get on that email list, be in the communication loop throughout the week, especially in this time of uncertainty, um, that would be the way to do it. Just fill up that blue communication card. Let us know that you want to get on that. And then we'll collect uh, those along with any tithes or offerings you want to give to, to God and to the ministry of the church. Normally we do that in about five minutes. But in light of uh, the coronavirus and what's going on, the way we're going to do it is, um, I'm still going to pray for the offering, give thanks for that. But you hang on to your offerings, hang on to those blue communication cards. And then at the end of the service, as you file out, the ushers will be back there holding the basket. And you can just place that offering, those communication cards into the basket. That's just to play it safe in terms of uh, the passing of the baskets one to another. We're trying to take every precaution we can to keep everybody safe. So, so that's how we'll do it today. That's not normally how we do it. Normally we would pass the baskets, but we won't be doing that today. Instead, it'll be at the end of the service. Okay? So keep that in mind. Um, okay, now, one of the emails that I sent out this week, just because it's, we're in such a strange, what a strange week it was, would you agree? I've never experienced a, a stranger week than that in my, uh, my life as a, uh, you know, an American or a, as a person. It was just a weird week in terms of uh, all the ebbs and flows and what's going on. So we sent out a, an email on Friday night from our leadership team. Uh, many of you probably got it and read it already. But for those that didn't, I just want to just touch on a few things um, from that, just so you kind of know where we're at as a church, uh, you know, this week and, and moving into the weeks to come, okay? So in the beginning, we talked about how it, it was a hard decision to know whether to, to have church today or not. You know, some churches are not having services today. They're just live streaming if they're able or just cancel the services. And, and we and the people that we were talking to were pretty divided. Some thought we should shut it down all together and just live stream. Some thought we, you know, it was maybe a little too early for that. In the end, the leadership team decided to hold a service for those that were comfortable in coming. And so, um, but I just want to, for us as a church, it would be easy for you that are here to, to, to think about those who are not here and at home and perhaps feel a little bit judgmental toward them, you know, whatever you might think. In the same way, it'd be easy for those who are at home to see we who are here and, and maybe pass judgment on us. Um, I really think uh, at this point at least 
we could really have gone two ways on this, and, and, and either way is, is, I think, a viable way to go. And so I think it's real important as we walk through this process, particularly as a church, that we be careful not to judge one another's choices uh, in the midst of all this. Okay, so hopefully we can, we can stay consistent with that. But we're just going to take it day by day, week by week, and uh, whether or not we have a service next week, we'll have to see what happens. So just be sure you're either staying in tune yourself through email or, you know, talking to somebody that is in tune so you know what's going on at the church, okay? So in deciding to gather this morning, we, we do really want to take careful precautions, though, to, to keep everybody safe in light of what's happening. And so here, I'm just going to read um, what, we, what I sent out in the email in terms of the precautions that we're, we're, we're doing. So I said, uh, <clears throat> we will suspend the shaking of hands and hugs and endeavor as best we can to keep the recommended social distance of six feet, okay? You see some of you are breaking that here this morning, but uh, you didn't know probably that that's what we were trying to do. And, 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 and as I said, we're going to do the best we can to do that. And it's hard not to hug and it's hard not to shake a hand. A lot of you are huggy and sh- shaky and I am too. But, uh, but for now, I think the way we got to go is to suspend that. So, so try to do your best on that. Okay, another thing, we will be sure to stay home and keep our kids home if we or they are sick. Okay, the communications have been very clear from our you know, nation leaders on that. We cannot be too careful at this time and need to uh, be very thoughtful about the health and well-being of others. We will endeavor to cover our calves with our elbows and to use Kleenex when we sneeze or wipe our noses and then throw them in the garbage. We will be especially careful, thoughtful, and prayerful about coming to gatherings if we are older or in poor health. You know, those folks are particularly vulnerable. We will not serve food or drinks for a time. Normally we would have our coffee bar, we'd have goodies and things like that. You notice we don't have those today. Um, We will not make the water fountain available. We will be careful to wash our hands for the recommended 20 seconds when necessary. Uh, We will have as much hand sanitizer available as possible. You know that's pretty hard to come by, but we have some. And we will try to refrain from touching or rubbing our mouths, noses, and eyes. Okay, so those are all, everybody's hearing about all that stuff. Um, These things are important, you know, if not for yourself, for others. And so let's really do the best we can to do those things, okay? Just a couple of other things we mentioned in the the email. I've already mentioned the live stream. So some people are watching from home. All you have to do is is go to our um, Water's Edge website and and click on uh, uh, YouTube and you click on that and it goes right to a live stream. So if you're at some point next week, you feel uncomfortable coming, you can still tune in to a service, even if it's just, just me here and the worship team here, we want to uh, continue to hold a service if even from afar. So keep that in mind. And then the other thing that this whole thing affects for churches is giving. You know, this is a, a nonprofit organization, and, and what we do is based on the generosity of, of all of you. And so if, if this is your, um, you know, church home, um, and you are somebody who gives, you know, typically on a Sunday to, to, to this ministry, and, and you're not able to be here next week or however many weeks, um, we just ask that you would keep that in mind and continue to give. And, and, and then there's uh, information on our website as well about how to do that. You can give online. You can send in a check. There are ways to give without being here. And so um, just keep that in mind as, as, as we walk through this whole, whole process, okay? Lots of information, but uh, it's in a, you know, just a, a strange time and information is necessary here at this point in time. So, so keep all those things in mind moving forward. And if you have any questions, feel free just to ask and call and we'll, we'll let you know what's going on. Okay? So if you didn't know, um, oh, and one other thing, this, I forgot that. If you look in your bulletins there looking ahead uh, on the inside cover, we were supposed to have our birthday service today, praise and testimony service we suspended that just due to the complications with, you know, speaking into the same mic. Uh, we were going to have lunch afterwards. We thought that wasn't a good idea. So we're going to postpone that. We'll reschedule that for another time. And then uh, the same is true for the annual business meeting, which was supposed to be next week. We're going to have a lunch that was going to go with that. We're going to postpone that as well, and we'll schedule that at, a, at another date. Everything else uh, below that is as, as, at this point on as a church, okay? And then we'll again keep you abreast if anything else has changed and we'll let you know um, uh, what's happening with that, okay? 
All right, I'm sure you've got some questions, but we won't field those at, at this time. Instead, I'm going to call Josh Belinsky up. Um, some of you might have heard that, that our President, uh, President Trump declared today to be a uh, national day of prayer. And so we thought it would be appropriate, um, along with hopefully lots of other people in our nation, to be uh, just praying together for this coronavirus out outbreak and everything else that's going on. So I asked Josh if he would come up and uh, lead us in that prayer this morning. So as, as Josh prays out loud, let's make sure that you know, we're, we're quieting our hearts and just agreeing with him, and we'll lift up our nation and this situation up. Okay? Josh, come on and pray for us. <clears throat> I actually want us to just bow before the Lord. And I had a song come to my heart this morning as we were in the prayer meeting. <coughs> it's called I Lift My Hands uh, by Chris Tomlin. And I just want to sing this verse over us um, and the chorus. It's really sweet and it reminds us of who our God is, that he is a healer. I'm just going to sing this briefly and then I'll pray. <clears throat> and it starts off by saying, be still. There's a healer. Be still, there is a healer. His love is deeper than the sea. His mercy, it is unfailing. His arms are fortress for the weak, so let faith arise, let faith arise. I lift my hands to believe again. You are my refuge, you are my strength. As I pour out my heart, these things I remember. You are faithful, God, forever. Let's pray. Father, I believe this song is for us. Your word says for us to use psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to exhort one another. And I believe what you are saying through this song is that you want us to be still and know that you are our healer. I thank you for what you did last night. I, I, I shouldn't be surprised. I was. I was blessed. I was amazed. But Lord, with this virus that is spreading in America, I thank you that you are a healer and we can run to you. And I believe this is a promise for us. We don't know all the effects that it will have on anyone here, but Lord, we thank you that we can run to you. And so, Lord, for those this morning who perhaps, who perhaps are struggling in their faith, Lord, I, I pray for them. Because this song says, let's put our faith in Christ. Let your faith arise. So, Lord, let us as a congregation, let our faith arise and maybe put it in Jesus Christ, who is the great physician. He is our healer. And when he came, he healed, and he still heals today. And Lord, this song talks about remembering your goodness. So we remember your goodness this morning. We don't want to forget that you are still good, even in the midst of this trial that's gripping our nation, gripping the world. Your love is deeper than the sea. Your mercy, it is unfailing. It never fails us as born-again believers. We wake up, and you are still with us. And Psalm 23 says, when we walk through this valley of the shadow of death, it seems like there's a shadow across the world right now. It says, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And so we remember this. We remember that our great God and Jesus Christ is right here with us in the middle of this trial. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the fire, who else was there? It was Jesus. In the fire. And he delivered. So, Lord, we lift our hands. We put our trust in you. You are our refuge. You are our strength. We do pour out our heart to you. And we ask for healing. We ask for protection for the people of this nation. We ask that you draw souls to Jesus Christ and that people be born again through this. You're doing a work in our hearts, Lord, through this. 
because you make no mistakes. You have not fallen off your throne. You are in control. So we trust your sovereignty. We trust your heart. Thank you, Lord. We trust in you, and we're still. And we know for a moment, and we keep it in our hearts, that you are our healer. In Jesus' name, amen. I did, sorry. The, uh, the live stream is, is going downstairs uh, as it is every week down in the fellowship hall. So normally we'd have child care for your kids, as you know, uh, up through second grade. So if the kids are, are struggling and uh, you want to you know, take them out and take them down, that's available to you um, to go and just watch the service downstairs. And, and then the kids can, can uh, be a little squirmier if, if you're struggling with that, okay? Just to give you the heads up, okay? So the, uh, the text that I want to read this morning with you is Isaiah 43, uh, verses 1 through 7. Isaiah 43, 1 through 7. We're not looking at just one particular text today, but, but several. But uh, this is one of them. And, and uh, there's so many comforting and encouraging texts in the Bible um, in times of crises like these, you know, whether they be national or personal. Um, this is one that I've always found a high level of comfort in, so I hope that you will too. There's Bibles around you. You'll find it on page 603 in those black Bibles nearby you, okay? So when you found it, if you're able, stand up with me. We'll read God's Word this morning. <clears throat> so the Word of God says this, But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom. Cush and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Amen. And please take a seat. <clears throat> so, as I thought about just, just where, where things are at in our nation this week, um, obviously the, the coronavirus is on, I think, everybody's mind, at least to a degree, probably to a large degree, so I thought it'd be appropriate to, to, to preach a message on that this morning. And, and, uh, and this is the, the message that the Lord laid on my heart. Um, in our walks with Jesus Christ, God calls us to walk a lot of fine lines. Let me explain what I mean by that. Some of those fine lines that God calls us to walk are, are these sorts of things. He calls us to walk a line between ministry to family, ministry to church, and ministry to an unbelieving world. That's one of the lines he calls us to walk, right? We have to balance that out. He calls us to walk a line between being good stewards of our money, being financially responsible, and being radically, uh, sacrificially generous and giving with our money as well. That's another line we're called to walk, okay? He calls us to walk a line between ministering in our area of spiritual giftedness and passion and selflessly serving in areas of need. It's another line we're called to walk. Another one would be this. He calls us to walk a line between being thankful for 
and enjoying the many gifts that God has given us and falling in love with the world and making idols of those gifts. Those are just a few of the lines that the Lord calls us to walk in our walk with him. Jesus himself walked a lot of lines as well. Okay? Here are some of the lines he walked. Jesus had to walk a line between uh, word ministry and deed ministry. He was called to preach and teach. He was also called to, to heal and to restore. He had to walk that line. He was called to walk a line between uh, spending time with people and spending time alone with his father, right? He had to walk that line. We see him do that. He had to walk a line between uh, evangelism to unbelievers, leading unbelievers to Christ, and spending time alone with believers and discipling them. To walk that line. And finally, one other line that Jesus had to walk was between being uh, an open and welcoming friend to sinners and confronting sinners on their sin. Another line that Jesus walked. Properly walking these fine lines is done through a combination of several things. We do it through a combination of knowing and applying God's word to our lives. We do it by hearing and following the leading of the Holy Spirit. We do it by knowing and understanding ourselves. By being willing to be Uh, open ourselves up to and listen to other Christians and involving them in our decision-making. And we do it by a lot of good old-fashioned trial and error. We're not always going to walk these lines right, and we're going to realize that, and next time we'll walk them better. Okay, so those, all of those things go into properly walking the lines that God calls us to walk. So in light of the recent coronavirus outbreak, God has called us to walk a fine line that if we walk it well, will bear fruit for Jesus, not only now, but in the future. Okay, And I talk about that fine line in the first paragraph of the big email that was sent out to the church on Friday night Okay, about our uh, coronavirus plan at the water's edge. So here's, here's what I said about it and see if, if this makes sense to you. So I said, It has been a challenge to figure out the best way to proceed in light of this current crisis. Here's the key Uh, sentence for today. As good ambassadors for Christ, we need to walk a tight line between overreacting, being anxious, and being fearful, and underreacting, being cavalier, and especially being insensitive and unloving toward our neighbors, particularly our elderly, frail, and more fearful ones. Okay? Jesus knew exactly how to walk this line all the time, and hopefully he will teach us to become more like him in that regard through this crisis. The world is watching, and the Lord has given us an opportunity to shine bright. By God's grace, we will take full advantage of it. Okay? So I think a key to us shining bright in the midst of, of, of however long this crisis lasts as followers of Christ, is going to be how we walk this line between overreaction, fear and anxiety, and underreaction, cavalier attitude, and unlovingness toward our neighbors. We need to walk that line, and that's what we're going to talk about today. How do we walk it? Okay? So, first of all, what is what we're calling, I'm calling, the, this coronavirus line? Okay, what is it? Let's just make clear we understand what it is. Okay, so the line that I'm talking about, I just said it, I'll say it a third time. The line between overreacting, being anxious, and being fearful, and underreacting, being cavalier, and being insensitive and unloving toward our neighbors. That's the line that we're talking about here. Okay, so just thinking about that line for a second. Okay, there, there is, is plenty of things going on in our world and in our United States and in Minnesota and probably pretty soon in Duluth to be reacting about and, and even to be overreacting about. Okay, there's, there's plenty of things to be anxious about, potentially. There's plenty of things to be fearful of. Okay, let me just share with you some if you're not already aware. Okay, we're dealing with this coronavirus 
with a, a deadly disease. Okay? We're dealing with something that's brand new, in a sense. We're dealing with something that is fast spreading and very easy to catch. We're dealing with uh, something that's difficult to know whether somebody else has it or not. It's invisible in a sense, right? It disguises itself as other things potentially. Um, We're dealing with something at this point has no cure or vaccination for it. We're dealing with something that's worldwide, that's everywhere in the news, that people and governments are taking very seriously. I mean, think about the, the things that are being canceled and shut down throughout our nation. Throughout nations are being shut down, right? So, so the world is taking this very, very seriously. Um, we're dealing with something that's radically affecting our economy and our lives already. And we're dealing with something that um, is very uncertain and unpredictable at this time, okay? So is there reason to be anxious? Is there reason to be fearful? Is there reason to be reacting to this? Absolutely there is. That's legitimate. Okay? Very legitimate. So we need to, to keep that in mind. Okay? That's, so that's one end of the spectrum. The other end is, is, is the other end. So that, that's... Some, so, and some people are in that spot, I should say. So, so you know people, maybe you are that person that is in that camp. I'm afraid, I'm anxious, and I'm, I'm reacting to this. I'm, I'm, I'm getting my hands on as much toilet paper as I can and, and as much food as I can, and I'm, I'm shutting it down, and I'm, I'm self-isolating you know, isolating and all those different things. That's, that's a legitimate response to what's going on. We shouldn't judge people that are responding that way. Okay? The other end of the spectrum, and you, maybe you're in this camp, or maybe you know people that are in this camp, is, is, is this, underreacting. There's people that are underreacting to this as well. Being cavalier, which is um, to show lack of proper concern, a cavalier attitude, and being insensitive and unloving toward neighbors. Okay? And, and what I mean by that is that... Uh, I. Uh, I think it's very possible for us who are not as afraid or not as concerned to not have others in mind who are, right? That's very easy to respond that way too, and some people are. And, and there's reason to underreact too. Um, you know, one, one reason to underreact is that people have a tendency to overreact. And so we jump on that other side of that. We want to respond to the overreaction by underreacting, Okay. Another reason is, and I think this is the biggest one, that this coronavirus, we know it. For those of us that are young and healthy, you know, or who have kids that are young, uh, you know, the, the information that's coming out is that this is not something that's going to, to, to kill us, right? It's not something that's going to harm us that much. So if I get the coronavirus, I ought to be okay because of this, my status of health, right? But uh, that's not true of everybody. And we need to keep that in mind. If I contract the coronavirus and spread it to somebody that's not in the same state of health, then that, that's not being sensitive to them and loving them, right? Um, another reason we might underreact or have this cavalier attitude is that it, it hasn't yet uh, come to Duluth, Minnesota, right, as far as we know. There's no confirmed cases in Duluth, so it hasn't hit us yet. So, so why do I need to worry about it, Right? And finally, especially for Christians, another reason we may have this attitude, and part of this is right and good, and we'll see this, is that we say God is on the throne. Right? God is on the throne. God is in control. So I don't need to be afraid of anything, including this coronavirus. Right? And that's, that's true, and that's good, but what that can do is lead to underreaction and lack of love and sensitivity, and we have to guard against that, okay? So, that's the line that I'm talking about. So now here's the question. How do we walk this coronavirus line? How do we stay in the right right place on this where God and Christ would want us to be? Okay, I think the answer is this. Here's how we do it. By following in Jesus' footsteps, and those footsteps were these. Jesus trusted in God's sovereignty, God's goodness, and God's promises, while at the same time 
being careful to be loving and sensitive towards others, respectful of those in authority, and aware of his own personal responsibility. Okay? So I'm going to break that down for you. That's, I think that's how Jesus walked through these crisis situations. I think that's how we can walk through this crisis situation along the line that God would want us to walk. Okay? So, taking the first part first. Um, Jesus kept in mind always, and we need to keep in mind always as Christians, that God is sovereign, that God is good, and that God, his promises are sure and can be counted on. Okay? So when we talk about the sovereignty of God, we're talking about God's control over things that happen in life and in the world. And the Bible teaches that God is in complete Sovereign control of everything from the biggest, baddest thing to the smallest, most mundane thing. Okay? So just a couple of verses that speak to that. Ephesians 1.11 says that God works all things according to the counsel of his will. So what does all things mean? It means all things. <laughs> Every single thing that ever happens, big, small, good, bad, God works according to the counsel of his will. And that certainly includes all that's happening with the coronavirus. Okay? Another verse that speaks to God's sovereignty is Isaiah 45. It says, I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I form light and create darkness, I make well-being, and I create calamity. I am the Lord who does all of these things. Okay? So, so the Lord, the one and only God, does all of these things. Okay? All of these things. Nothing's out of his control. And then in regard to the small things of life, you, you think the things that don't matter you know, God's not in control of this, is he? Well, I think he is. And Jesus speaks to this, and he speaks to it in the context of fear, which some of us are dealing with, many are dealing with. Right? Here's what he says in Matthew 10 to his disciples. He says, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy <clears throat> both body and soul in hell. And, and who is that? That's God. God's the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Jesus is saying, fear him. Okay, don't, don't fear him, them who can kill the, the, uh, the body. Don't fear that disease that can kill the body. Who's, what should you fear? You should fear God. God's the one that, that, that holds eternal sway over things, determines eternal destinies. That's who we should be fearing. Now listen to what he says after this, though. It gets positive for, for we who are followers of Christ. He says, Jesus, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your Father. Okay, so sparrows are seemingly insignificant. They're, they're not expensive to buy. They're not a big deal. But not one of them ever falls to the ground apart from the plan of God. Okay? God is sovereign over everything, big and small. Okay? Um, then he says to the disciples, But even the hairs on your head are numbered. I care so much about you that I know how many hairs you have in your head. I know where hair one is, where hair of 1,150 is. I know every hair on your head. I know you inside and out, he says to his disciples. Therefore, fear not. You are more valuable than the sparrows. Okay? So I have the sparrows' life under control. You're way more valuable than the sparrows. I have your life under control too. That's the point that Jesus is making. You don't have to be afraid. You should be afraid of one thing. That's me. If you're not right with me, that is God, then you should get right with me. But once you're right with me, you don't have anything to be afraid of anymore because I love you and I'll take care of you. 
Okay? So, God is sovereign totally over everything. The next thing that's important, Jesus remembered that. We should remember that in this time. God is sovereign. He's got things under control. God is good. God is good, right? Lamentations 3.25 says, The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. God is good to everybody, even to the ones that don't seek him, but he's particularly good to you who know him and who seek him. He's with you. He's good, okay? Listen to what our verse that we read today says, Isaiah 43. Just such a sweet verse about the goodness of God, especially towards his people. And in a couple places in here, I want to substitute your name. You should substitute your name in here for for the, the nation of Israel. Listen. It says, But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob. Put your name in there. But thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Eric. He who formed you. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Hear that from God. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Why? Here's he tells us. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Eric and Will and Becky, your Savior. He's your, he's your God. He's your Savior. He who formed you, made you, he's yours. He saved you. Okay? I give, and he puts Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you. So uh, just read the rest of it. Because you are precious in my eyes, and I honored you, and I love you. That's crazy to me. Put your name in there. You are precious in God's eyes. You are honored by God, and God loves you. I gave men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. And, and, and you know, the Egypt, Cush, Seba, peoples, that doesn't make as much sense. But if you put Jesus Christ in there, it makes a lot of sense because that's true for us today. And that was true for the people of God back then too, but Jesus hadn't come yet. But for us, think about, let me read this to you again from that perspective. I gave my one and only son, Jesus Christ, as your ransom in exchange for you because you are precious in my eyes and I honor you and I love you. I give Jesus Christ in return for you in exchange for your life. That's how much God loves you if you're in Christ. If you've trusted in Christ, that's how good he is to you. That's how much he loves you. And that should give us great comfort. Okay? Finally, thirdly, um, God's promises are sure. I love Joshua, the end of Joshua on this. Um, Joshua is speaking to the, the people. He's about to die. And this is what Joshua says. He's seen the taking of the promised land. He's overseen the whole thing. And here's what he says about it. He says, And now I am about to go the way of all the earth. I'm about to die. And you know in your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. Okay? God will keep his promises. There is no question. There is no doubt. He has always kept them. He will always keep them. So what are some important promises that God is going to keep in regard to our current situation with the coronavirus? I think one is this. Clark loves this one. And we know that in all things, God works for the good and the lives of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. This coronavirus situation will be worked for good in your life if you love God. That's a promise. Okay? What exactly that looks like, we'll have to see. Okay? But the promise is it will be worked for good. And we can lean on that. And then secondly, 2 Corinthians 4.17 says, For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us 
an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Okay? Whatever we face in this lifetime, no matter how great the trial, it is light and momentary in comparison to the eternal weight of glory that God is preparing for us on the other side. And we must lean on that in these sorts of times, okay? So the sovereignty of God, the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God to keep his promises should give us great confidence in the midst of any trial, including the one that we're currently in. We do not need to be afraid, okay? And yet, that should not cause us to be underreactive, insensitive, unloving, and cavalier. We shouldn't just be going, running around, feeling as though I'm, I'm bulletproof and I, I just could do whatever I want and I don't care about anybody else. That's not how Jesus operates. It's not how we should operate either. So there's another side to this. Okay, so, so how do we uh, avoid that other side of the coin, right? This cavalier attitude. Okay, here's how we do that. At the same time, we need to remember that God calls us to love others He calls us to be respectful of authority, and he calls us to take personal responsibility seriously. Okay? Let me break that down for you. Okay? Jesus said that we are to love our neighbor as ourself. Okay? If we think to ourselves, I'm healthy, my kids are healthy, if I get it, it doesn't really matter, so I'm not going to change my behavior at all, that's not loving our neighbor. It's not being sensitive to our neighbor who is not in that same place. Okay? We must keep others in mind as we live our lives. We must love our neighbors as ourselves. Okay? Jesus also says, Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And he says the things that should mark uh, our Christianity is our love. Okay? Other people will know that we're Christians by our love. We have an opportunity now, even though we're bold, even though we're confident, we have a great opportunity to sacrificially love others by not flaunting that, by not being cavalier, but by being sensitive to others who are around us, okay? So we're called to love, okay? The other thing that we're called to do is respect authority, okay? It would be easy for us to say, you know, the president's saying this, and our governor's saying that, and our mayor's saying this, and world leaders are saying this, and the World Health Organization is saying that. But, you know, I'm a Christian. I'm bulletproof. I don't know if I trust these things. I just do what I want to do. Okay? That's not what Christ did, and that's not what he's calling us to do. Romans 13, 7 says this. Excuse me. Romans 13, 1 through 7 says, Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. And then it, fast forwarding to the end, it says, Give everyone uh, what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If you owe revenue, pay revenue. If you owe respect, then pay respect. If you owe honor, then pay honor. Okay? Unless our governing authorities are telling us to do something that is against what the Bible says, we are called to respect, to come under, to honor, and to trust that God has put these authorities in place. So we should be listening to what the governor and mayor and president and world health experts are saying, taking that very seriously and trying to come under that. Okay? Just as Jesus did in his life. Okay? And then, thirdly, we're called to take personal responsibility for our own well-being and the well-being of others. In other words, you know, we have to take action steps. We're supposed to. We can't just sit back uh, and lean on the sovereignty of God. We have to be proactive. James talks about this. James said to be doers of the word and not hearers only. James also said this 
If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, Go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? Okay? We have to do more than just say things. We have to be doers. We have to be taking responsibility. Think about Jesus. Jesus didn't just run cavalierly into dangerous situations, trusting that God would protect him or thinking to himself, if I die, I die. Okay? He took responsibility. Jesus chose not to throw himself off the temple mount when the devil tempted him to do so. Jesus chose to change his roots and patterns when his fame began to spread and the likelihood of be, him being taken in and arrested before the, his time increased. And Jesus chose to plead with his father three times to take the cup of the cross from him in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus took action steps. He took responsibility. Also, Jesus didn't just sit back and wait for God and his sovereignty to fix everything for him. Jesus took responsibility. He was watchful and careful. He was prayerful. Uh, he healed, fed, loved, served, sacrificed his rights, his comforts, and even his own life for the glory of God and for the good of others around him. We need to follow in Jesus' footsteps. Okay? So, what will be the benefits of walking this coronavirus line both now and in the future, okay? The future benefits of walking this line today is that this isn't the last crisis that we're going to face. We will face more crises as a nation. You will face more crises as an individual. You will be tempted, depending on who you are and where you're at, either to underreact or overreact, okay? So what you learn from this crisis now will benefit you in future Crises. So we want to learn as much as we can. Okay? But in terms of the here and now, we have an opportunity, you guys, to be a light and a blessing to others. Okay? Think about some of these verses. Uh, Philippians 4 or 5 says, To us Christians, us followers of Christ, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. We have an opportunity to show the world as Christians, what it means to be reasonable in the midst of crisis, to not get too far off on either end of things, okay? To find that right biblical middle ground. Philippians 2.14 says, Do all things without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, Okay? There was a million things for us right now to grumble and question about, right? We could be complaining about, uh, you know, the way the government is handling things. We could be complaining about how China handled things and how it came over to us. We could be complaining about somebody buying up all the toilet paper. We could be complaining and grumbling about a million things. But if we were to not do that, trust God, live differently, we would shine bright in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation who's going to spend the next many months grumbling about everything. Okay? Finally, Matthew 5, 16, Jesus said this, In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You guys, this is an opportunity for us to shine through good works. And when a pandemic like this strikes, it causes people to think of past pandemics. And past pandemics have been opportunity for Christians to shine bright through sacrificial, loving, good works. Okay? And I want to close with this story. Between 251 and 266 AD, the plague of Cyprian spread from Africa throughout the known world. It was transmitted person to person by physical contact and by touching or using clothing and items infected by the sick. Half of all the people who encountered the disease died. And at its height, 5,000 people were dying a day in Rome. During the pandemic, government officials and the wealthy fled the cities or the countryside, to escape with those who were infected. 
The Christian community, however, remain behind, transforming themselves into a great force of caretakers. On Easter Sunday in 260 AD, Bishop Dionysus of Corinth praised the efforts of the Christians, many of whom had died while caring for others. He said this, Most of our brother Christians showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking only of one another. Heedless of danger, they took charge of the sick, attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ. And with them departed this life serenely happy, for they were infected by others with the disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors and cheerfully accepting their pains. The early Christians' dedication to caring for their neighbors as themselves during times of plague and sickness, whether the sick were believers or not, showcased the integrity of their unique message of love for others. These Christ-like actions had great social impact and attracted outsiders to the faith. This kind of selfless love caused an explosion of Gentile Christian congregations to arise alongside Judeo-Christian communities. Now, I don't know what's going to happen with this disease, and I'm not suggesting that you necessarily do what these Christians of old did. But what I am saying is this is an opportunity for us. An opportunity for us as Christ followers to walk this line rightly, to shine bright for him, to bring glory to God, and to bring others to Jesus. And let's pray on that. Lord God, I praise you this morning that when we're in Christ, we have nothing to fear. At the same time, Lord, I, I thank you for Jesus' example of being loving toward and sensitive to everyone else. Thank you that in Christ we can live sacrificial lives because of the sacrifice that you made for us, God. When you sacrificed for us, yourself on the cross, you secured for us um, in, in unestimable, uh, eternal future that allows us to live lives of sacrifice today. God, as we walk through this coronavirus situation, God, I pray for your Holy Spirit's power. I pray for your Holy Spirit's wisdom. And I, I pray for your Holy Spirit um, to help us to uh, know how to walk this line, know how to love, and to be willing to take advantage of the opportunity that this affords us to shine for you. We praise you for all you are and for all you're doing. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Stand up with us and let's sing to the Lord. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory my God, all the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. Oh, the wonderful cross, oh, the wonderful cross me come and die and find that I may truly live. Oh, 
the wonderful cross, oh the wonderful cross, all who gather here by grace draw near and bless your name. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did there such love and sorrow meet or thorns compose so rich a crown oh the wonderful cross oh the wonderful cross bids me come and die and find that I may truly here by grace draw near and bless your name were the whole realm of nature mine that were a present far too small love so amazing so divine demands my soul my life my all father i just thank you that we were even given the chance and the opportunity to come today and to to have that choice to have that freedom but I just pray for an extra, just extra peace, extra just humbleness as we go about the rest of this weekend, the rest of this week, that we do treat each other with kindness and respect, and that above all, that you are in control. So thank you for everything, and I just pray that we have a wonderful day ahead of us. In your name, amen. amen. Go in peace, everyone.